Brilliant. So thank you, everybody, and welcome to the first of 2022's The Contact Centre Network. And I'm really excited today because it's um, we've got the the MD of uh, Web Help, Andrew Hall, joining us. And we're going to uh, put Andrew through his paces in terms of questions about the future of uh, customer service. Uh, and given the kind of the last couple of years, we've all been to if you are on the uh, line and if you would just want to pop yourselves on mute, that'd be great. Otherwise, we hear your, your dog, your cat, your kids or whatever you're cooking for your dinner uh, in the background. <laughs> um, so I, I want to say thank you, first of all, to Andrew for, for joining us. Um, the session that we've got today is a bit of a, um, I've, I've referenced it as Parkinson versus question time. Um, as, as a bit of a as a bit of a format, so I've got some questions that I've um, pre-prepared for um, Andrew just to kind of start the conversation flowing. Um, but as ever, these events are your events. So the questions that you've got for the panelists, for me, for for anybody on this session, really, um, are the things that make this much more interactive, sets it slightly differently in terms of the normal format of um, a webinar. So what we want to do is we want to hear from you guys in terms of questions that you've got, observations that you've made over the last couple of years about how customer service might have changed and what the future of it looks like in the next 12, 18 months, three years, however far we want to shoot out. Um, but just a, an observation from me, I did um, a recent poll on LinkedIn about how how is customer service? Is it getting better? Is it getting worse or has it stayed about the same? And what was frightening is that there was over 100 people complete, completed in the poll and over 50% of those said that customer service was getting worse, um, which I, I thought was, was quite frightening because I thought we'd come out of um, a bit of a, a turning point with, with COVID and a lot of people had moved to more digital mediums and embraced um, AI and chatbots and web chat and all sorts of things that we discovered when... We, we came into this omni-channel world, but has that actually made the situation worse? So I'm quickly going to share my screen before I, um, I introduce Andrew. And I've got a question for everybody. Um, so if I share the screen. Um, the question is, in fact, we can do it without the screen share. Uh, so my question for everybody, and what I want you to do is if you haven't discovered where the chat is, in this last two years, where on earth have you been? So there should be a little chat button in front of you, and it's got a couple of um, red dots on it already from people who are speaking. But my question to everybody in this group is, what does the future hold for customer service? Um, where, where is it going? What do, we, what do we see as the next um, innovation in customer service? Or actually, what are some of the fundamentals that need to be fixed? I'm really interested in everybody's views on here because we've got over 30 people in the group right now. Um, and lots of people from different industries, different segments. So I'm really interested to understand what's your view on the future of customer service. And what we're going to do as you start to populate some of those in the chat, don't be shy. Let's get one in from everybody. And then we've got a decent bunch of um, observations and questions that we can come back to when we go into the um, into the question time zone of uh, today's session. And of course, what happens as you start a webinar? Your phone goes in the background. So apologies for that. You'll hear my dulcet tones in just one second with the Fab Solutions um, voicemail. Um, so we've got some stuff going into the, the chat, which is great. Um, but Andrew, welcome to today's panel. You are, it's the first time that you've come on to the, the Contact Centre Network events. Um, and it's really good to have you. Thank so you. just give us a little bit of a, an introduction into yourself and what you do at WebHelp. Thanks very much, Gary. And, uh, and and before I start, thank you very much, everyone, for uh, for bearing with me on this and taking an hour of your time to come and listen to my dulcet tone. So uh, I'm really keen to hear from you guys as well. And uh, having done a lot of uh, round tables over the years, the one thing I find is 90% of people say, oh, I'm just a sponge. I'm, I just want to listen to what's going on. And you get a couple of people that want to talk a lot. I'm really hoping today that I get to listen to you and don't have to do quite as much talking. So, uh, you know, I think I'm keen for it to be interactive as well. Um, so, I, I mean, I'm one voice in many. You guys are all experts in this space as well. So just to recognise that and, and I have an opinion on certain things that I know you guys will either agree or disagree. And, and uh, you know, I look forward to debating and, uh, and hopefully agreeing more or less on, on where we're trying to go with this industry. First off, I'm, I'm, I'm hugely passionate about this industry. 
Um, I think we work in the best industry in the world. Um, I think we get to see people be happy um, with, with a, a really good customer experience. And I think all too often we fail to, to give people that experience. And so my career, you know, almost regardless of which job I'm in, um, has been to focus in on what do we do to get customers to have a better relationship with their, with their, uh, with their the suppliers and, uh, and how do we ensure that you know, customers get um, what they want as quick as they can and with the experience that they want to have. So on, on that basis, I, I, I've kind of crossed over between outsourcing and technology. So I've worked in the um, omni-channel space, selling technology around omni-channel. I've worked a lot around RPA, AI type activities as well. Uh, when I ran my own business, uh, supporting a couple of companies, um, and uh, and I've worked you know fairly extensively across what, what you guys would know, I guess, is outsourcing BPO. Uh, we tend to call it customer management engagement now rather than outsourcing because the connotations that outsourcing has kind of built over the years, which aren't all together positive. I think. Engagement, I'm outsourcing. Just ah. go on mute. That'd be great. <laughs> Um, and uh, and, I, and I, so I think um, you know so as, as we try to uh, to progress our industry, you know what we're trying to do is to um, I guess invoke a, a closer relationship with customers to see if we can bring something a little bit more um, than, than just a, a traditional bums on seats, lower price, and so forth and so on. So you know, and I think that's what the industry has needed for a long time, and and you know trying to get closer to companies and in, in how they engage their customers and bring more value. So my role at the moment is, is, uh, is as, as, as Gary said, is, is managing director of, of customer solutions. So I work with um, you know, customers across web help to, uh, to try and bring forward the very best that we've got and to see if we can support them in, uh, in doing a better job or, or at least the same equal job that they're doing if it's excellent around customer. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, the, I mean, the, the landscape in, in customer service, I, I think has changed dramatically over the last two years, Andrew. And I think when we look at, some of the um, the customer satisfaction reports that have come out over the last 12 months, digital channels are increasingly more popular. And actually for the first time in the 2021 um, customer satisfaction report, the, for the first time over 50% of the customer experience that they recorded were digital in nature. So if, if I was to ask you that, and I think when we look at the, the, the digitization of customer service, um, how well have we done that over the last 18 months? Um, it's an inevitability when you have lots of new entrants coming in the market who are digitally native, that you, for a period of time, we're going to see an increase in digital engagement. Um, it, it's also an inevitability given the last few years that we've had that companies are gonna try and push harder on getting people to go to digital. Um, it, it's also fair to say that, you know, companies are trying to move people into automated transactions and cut people out yeah. because actually they plain just want to get things done. And if it's transactional in nature, what, why wouldn't you? Um, if it's, if it's more to do with, um, you know, a question, then, then again, you, you can do that automated. You can have a good FAQ and do it from that way. But, but when you need to speak to someone that's still there. And so what you find is that while we're seeing an increase in digital, um, over time we'll see voice start to potentially grow a little bit back because I think some of these um, you know, digitally natives, which are driving a lot of the, you know, the engagement in the market now, um, are starting to introduce voice because they recognize that they're getting to a complex point with their customers where chat and other services don't, other channels don't deliver the same outcomes. And so voice becomes a, an inevitability. You know, we're, we're currently talking to one organization um, putting who, who are exclusively chat pretty much well pretty much exclusively 90 percent chat at the moment and uh, and they're already forecasting a you know considerable increase in in voice over the, over the next few years because of the nature of their business with their clients and their engagement with their clients um, you know I, I think that's a really interesting point and i think i'm looking forward to getting to the uh, the chat in a, in a short while because i think some of the things that you said there really really resonate for me and i think the the way that People say, "Is voice dying out?" And is that is the good the, the time of the customer service agent disappearing? I, I pretty much disagree. But I think when we look at voice as a as a channel and some of the the different activities that are coming that use voice and that allow us to interact with with voice in different ways, like Siri, like Alexa, how do you think that's going to play a role in the future of customer service in building that interaction with the contact center? 
I, so I, I think the first thing to say is I think the way that omnichannel has been deployed as a whole is very poor. Um, and, and they tend to, despite having the capability to deliver omnichannel, and, and my, I, I used to have a very simplistic way of looking at omnichannel as a, um, if you've been to one of these kids' soft play areas, where they go in and they can muck around in this big center up and down the slides, they can climb and all sorts of things. And they can choose which way they go in, they can choose which way they traverse it, um, they can choose which way they come out of it. And as parents, we sit outside and watch our kids and make sure they're safe and so forth and so on. You know, and in a, in a sense, as parents, we're looking in, we're doing the data analysis, we're making sure that it's working properly for our children and we're feeding back when things look dangerous and so forth. Our children are just going in and sometimes they have to have a bit of a tough time when it doesn't work quite quite right and other times they go down the slide and the, and, and the journey is fantastic and and if you think of omnichannel as that ability to be able to move seamlessly between channels they've not done that we've not implemented an omnichannel experience and i'm just looking at someone in the in the chat talking about what's happened you know what tends to happen is we end up with still very silo channels um you know there was always this push for chat companies unfortunately the technology industry can't imagine that but it's just gone very dark outside sorry i hope that you can still see me um but the uh, you know the chat organizations who sell their technology wanting to push everyone to chat and uh you know and, and everyone else saying well how do we get back to voice if we get into chat we get stuck and and if we need to get our customer back into a voice channel how do we do that and the problem is when you have a single view of omni channel that says it's all about deflection which is a pretty negative term um you know then, then you get people trapped in the digital channel and and then all of the other human-based channels you know like voice um you know become become uh, a, a little bit uh, harder to use so I think the first thing is to get omnichannel to work properly, we have to have a proper strategy around what omnichannel actually is and, and how we engage and, and, and move across those channels as organisations. And, and, and that do, takes some work. Do you think we can truly get to omnichannel or do you think we will always be in that, that realm of multi-channel or blended channel rather than truly omni? Um, I mean, personally, the technology is out there um and and it's available for people to use i think what tends to happen i was working with a bank recently who um initially were going to keep with an on-premise type telephony platform and you, you kind of freak out and say what on earth are you doing that for this well we spent nine months designing it and we're saying well we'll, we'll do the same in cloud we'll put it in, in in a few weeks and they, they drop on the floor and their architects go mad and yeah. can't believe it's even possible and so they focus all their business case then on getting onto cloud telephony and they all clap and say that's fantastic and we did it with an energy company as well in my last role where to them they've, they've achieved a miracle and we said well what about integrating the chat into it now and they said oh you've got chat as well and we're like well hang on we've just gone a whole process with you talking about omni-channel you've got your, and, and then they say well we don't have the business case you know the business case was to get voice in it wasn't to get chat in um, and and so they never look at it holistically because they come at it from a silo mentality anyway and it starts with that that initial strategy, isn't it? It's how do you want to communicate to your customers? And importantly, how do you how do they want to communicate with you at the start point? So you can start to appeal to, to all, all realms of, of different levels of contact regardless. And I think it's interesting you talk about um, omni-channel and chat and all the other digital channels and deflection. And it, it's really made me think, have we, and we, we chatted about this in, in the pre, pre discussion to this is saying, have we actually lost the ability to communicate effectively human to human in a more omni-channel world? What, what would your thoughts be on that? Um, I think we live in an industry where we've got the most passionate people that do their job and they love doing their job and they genuinely care on the whole for speaking to customers and trying to get the right things said and done. That's the first point. Um, from a, an, an advisor that's going in to a quality person on the floor, to a, a, an SME supporting the agents, to, to the team leaders and the managers, everyone in that contact center, everyone in the organization wants to do the right thing. But the way that we're structured as organizations makes it very, very hard to deliver that kind of capability out and to allow people to do the job from technology failing them um, you know, to to um, you know, bad bad SLAs and and uh, targets that people have to try and get that are punitive, um, be it an outsourcer or be it internally, it doesn't really matter. To not taking advantage of the data that they've got to make that available, I think we make it very very hard for advisors to do the right thing. But there is also a difference in in the world of chat to the world of voice, and you have a different type of advisor and you have a different level of comprehension that's required. 
you know, so the market pays more for someone that does chat than they do for someone that does voice and probably rightly so um, to some degree, because you need that element of comprehension. Um, you know, so you, you could argue and, um, you know, that, that uh, you know, a lot of organizations are keen to blend. Um, and, you know, this is a this is a, a, a Marmite topic almost, isn't it, in terms of whether people blend agents across voice and chat or, or whether they, uh, they they keep them independent. If you want to blend them, then you need to kind of bring everything together and you have to have agents with all of that skill. That's quite hard to me. You know, that's quite a lot to try and do, but companies try and do it. Yeah. You know, so to me, comprehension is very key in the digital world. I think you need less comprehension, less writing ability, if you like, within within the voice world. Um, and that's fairly obvious. Um, but I, I, you know, I think it's a failure on behalf of the organizations to get things right for the agents to do the job best that they can than it is about the agents not being able to do the job. And I, and I think you've touched on something really, really interesting there because we've we've moved into a, this realm where two years ago there was there was less reliance on that whole comprehension piece. It was all about voice, or primarily it was about voice, and people were trying to find the foot with the right strategy for AI, for chatbots, for for web chat, for digital. Um, and we've not recruited specifically for those those types of individual. And as a consequence, what we're seeing, I suppose, over the over, certainly over the last six to twelve months, is this whole new badge that's the the Great Resignation. As if this this whole thing now is like the Great Resignation. People have suddenly come to this conclusion now: this job's not for me. We're all going to resign on mass. And the, the the thing that coming out of that is that one in four people are either planning to change employers in the next three to six months. So what does that have in terms of the, the type of person that we need to now recruit for the contact center that we might have historically recruited for? And how do we start to see that knock on impact on the future of customer service in those interactions that people have? So look, I, I reckon if we did a poll with everyone in this room about the great resignation, you get a different answer from everyone. Some people would say it's happening. Some people would say, no, it's not. Yeah, I read an article the other day that suggested 3% is about the number that's happening at the moment, which includes everyone res resigning anyway to change to a different job, let alone the great resignation. Um, and then you see these reports of 20 to 40 people are considering leaving their job. I, I'm, I'm, I think 20 to 40 people feel that they're not in the right career for themselves long term. Um, I'd love to be a musician. I wasn't good enough, but I'm in the job that I'm doing and I keep going at the job I'm doing because I can do it. Um, if I could stop and become a museum, a, a musician, then you know, a museum piece, um, a musician, that would be uh, that would be fantastic, you know. Or, or or even stop and go and you know, hang up my boots. And I can't do that. You know, it's not the reality of the world that we live in. I think there is something with younger people today where um, I think their ability to, or their in their mind, I think they're you know they're unsettled, um, and and they don't feel. And certainly, I've got three older kids who are in this camp. You know, they don't feel that they've quite found their place in life yet and, and they don't feel they've quite found what they want to do. Sadly, they all want to be musicians as well. I really did something interesting. With my You've family. got a band farm in there, Andrew, I think. I know, I know and they're, they're all going at it as well. So, uh, you know, but but they, they don't want to work in, in the same place that, that maybe people did in the past. And I think this is happening. I think and, and, and actually I'm quite excited by that. I think it makes sort of dynamic population who are trying to do something different and I think we do need a change we can't keep doing the same things and failing endlessly so we need to change you know and it's very good having some creative people around because I think we miss them um you know but I would say it's an, it's an interesting one. I have a, a client that we're talking to at the moment who um have really been struggling with um uh, recruitment in the UK now they're putting it down to the resignation and people you know not wanting to work in this this industry and and you know they're they're struggling with retention, particularly to keep people in. Now, if I look across our clients, we don't see that across everyone, but we do see it across some. And there are potentially you know different levels of interest that the jobs that we have for people peak. Um, you know, and and I think it, it's I think it's really interesting because when we offshore this to places like South Africa, where interestingly the empathy is very similar to the UK that the that we see from people. There is a, uh, and this might be very uh, sensitive, but but we see a massive gratefulness from people to have the kind of employment that they get there, where we don't always see that here. And that's not exclusively, we do see a lot of people here who are delighted with the roles that they've got and enjoy it and see it as a massive career progression to be able to build up from, from a, an advisor upwards. And there's probably lots of people on this call that have done that. 
Um, you know, and I know I know Steve Bartler, for example, from this, you know, the great CEO, has, he talked about being an advisor in a, in a call center and, and coming up from that basis. So it's a great starter for a career. But we're seeing, you know, we're seeing people abroad, you know, massively thank us for the opportunities. And we do a lot of impact sourcing now, bringing people out of, of you know, suburbs where this wasn't an opportunity and they're embracing it. And, and I think there is something around the US and the UK culture maybe that we need to think about coming to the great resignation if it's real. And, and how we ask people to come and work for us and, and how we engage. And that brings you into the gig economy and all of these kind of other ways of doing business. Yeah. And do you think, thinking about the, the, the changing role of the contact centre agent, what, what should we be looking for from a recruitment perspective for the future customer service agent? How, how does that kind of competency um, differ to, to maybe what we've got now? So there's a big question underlying that, isn't it? Which is, have we got digital right? Um, have we got have we got transformation of our business right? Because the contact center is only there. Um, you know, what the, the contact center operates on the basis of how well the rest of the business does. Yeah. If the rest of the business fails, I, in other words, from the point of engagement right the way through to to the sale, right the way through to service, right the way through to collections and arrears management and renewals. If all of that is streamlined and working perfectly, yeah. um, you know, then then uh, absolutely the role of contact center agents is is different. Um, if it doesn't, and you're still going to have the same work going to contact centers, it's not going to change. But if we if we get digital right, if we get operate uh, companies operating their marketing and their their engagement strategies correctly across all of the digital realm of the company, then in a sense, when it gets to the contact center, you you could argue the contact center is picking up points of failure. Um, it, it's picking up points of things that maybe didn't happen as well upstream as it could have done. Now. When we do that, the first thing we've got to do is recognize there may be points of failure we need to address. We need a way of feeding that back up the organization. Um, so, you know, this idea, and, and I also talk about in, in outsourcing where you have a, an outsourcer here or a contact center here and you have the company here and there's a little conduit that sits between them, of, of, a, bit, a bit of data and a bit of vendor management. Um, but, it, but it also exists within companies as well, where the contact center sits a little bit outside from the organization. And that was deliberate at first. Um, but actually, now we need to integrate it because the contact center is is such an, an intrinsic part of that customer experience and that customer journey. Um, and, and so we have to get to a point where you know, data is flowing to and from all of the organizations to be able to feed back. But the, the contact center employees, the advisors, you know, if we can get it right upstream, then, then clearly the work that they take on is going to be more complicated. Yeah. It's going to be you know, a, a, a higher detailed piece of work that they're going to have to do. And you know, they can't just um, get away with, with, with simple queries, you know, so you are looking at a more empath uh, um, empathetic kind of person that's going to be able to, to, to sit on the, um, I nearly said empathic, that would be wrong, wouldn't it? Um, <laughs> if if we were, we'd all be, we wouldn't be in this role. <laughs> I think if we had those, that would be perfect, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, but a, a, an empathetic kind of agent, uh, someone that is able to really get alongside the customer, because the chances are, that the our customer will be coming in a little bit more upset or, or, or insecure. And you know, we all know that you know, if you get upset and, and insecure, your, your cognitive ability drops what 40%, and uh, and and therefore you're gonna get upset and you're gonna not react as well. All these things, we know these things, you know. So you're then into how do I make sure my agent is empowered, which takes me back to what I said at the beginning. If we don't get everything sorted to give the agent the right experience, how can they give the customer the right experience? I, I wholeheartedly agree. And we, we talk a lot about vulnerable customer and we don't necessarily talk about vulnerable agents um, in, in the same breath. And I think when we think about identifying customer vulnerability and the increasing trend of digital interactions with customers, how do we safeguard for, for customer vulnerability in a digital world? Mm. And how, how is that going to evolve uh, for the future, do you think? I, this is really fascinating. And, and, and actually, there was a recent study, I don't know if anyone saw it, where it was talking about um, how many people, how many, amongst the group of advisors that they, they interviewed, they found that, you know, I think it's 40% of the advisors weren't sure that they were doing what the customer wanted them to do. They were already at a point, you know, it doesn't matter about digital, within the human realm, that's an issue. Um, you know, and, and picking up areas of vulnerability is also a really sensitive area because from a GDPR point of view, you've got to be very careful how you observe and how you pick up and how you feed back and what you hold, because you can get it wrong. And we all know AI fails, um, you know, so, but there are definite places where, you know, we deploy AI um, to an agreed policy with our clients. 
that allows us to monitor for um, certain entities that the client says. It allows us to monitor for certain phrases that allow us to track um, you know, the customer's view of the call that they're having, for example, um, and, uh, and, and to get a sense of um, their emotional quote, you know, their emotional quote and how they're feeling at any moment in time. And, and also to be able to track through the call how that changes so that, you know, because it might start at one state and then you slowly pick up that actually there's more to this. And in the digital realm, that's really hard to do. So you need to be equipping agents with with some kind of indicator, a traffic light type system where, you know, they, they can sense when something's not right, but also potentially have a, a more um, a deep learning type capability to be able to really understand vulnerability more. And, and again, we, we, we do that as well. And, 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 and it works to some degree with some clients and other clients that are very sensitive about this because of that GDPR impact. But, you know, you can train agents so far um, but you can certainly offer them a little bit more support, I think, with some of the new technology. Absolutely. And I, I, I think it goes back to then the type of agent that you have to recruit based on the complexity of the conversation, the complexity of the, the sales process, the servicing process, and the, the level of vulnerability that we're potentially putting those customers in because of the interactions that are coming through to the call centre being more detailed, being more complex and not as transactional because we've 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 developed the capabilities to service that up front. So I think it's, um, it, it spells really interesting times for the future of who we recruit, how we recruit and what pools we recruit from. Which well, I, think, I, think, I think it's more than that as well. So, you know, you've got financial services or any, any client that's regulated, anyone that does any kind of regulated activity now has a duty of care. Yeah. Um, and, and there are new regulations coming in around customer and duty of care to customer. Um, and if you fail, you can get fined. If you fail, you can lose your license. Um, you know, these are massive things and vulnerability is at the heart of that. So, you know, there, there, are, there are, you know, companies, if they're not doing it now, they, they're going to miss, miss the gate because it's happening right now. I'm going to, I'm going to delve into uh, some of the questions that we've got in the, the chat, uh, Andrew, because there's some really interesting ones. And I think um, uh, Kenneth Reeds uh, asked one around, we've talked about digital in conversation. We've talked about voice. What's the future for customer service and, and video? We're all on Zoom right now. How do, how do we perceive that to play out in, in, the, uh, in maybe the next six to 12 months? I don't know. Should we just go to Meta and start talking about Meta as well? <laughs> um, we're, I, we're talking about being empathic now, so we're, we're not even going to have to use words. <laughs> I, 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 look, I, there's, there was, there's been a lot of work done over, over you know, people people's desire to engage someone over video. And, and to start with, not everyone likes it. You know, um, people are generally comfortable going into a bank and speaking to someone face to face, for example. They're generally comfortable if they've got something that they're nervous about actually having a chat with someone. They're less comfortable having a face to face with someone if it's something uncomfortable. Um, and, uh, you know, and if there's a process they're following, they kind of rather be, um, that, that level of abstracted from the person by having a chat with them to some degree, you know, if they're applying for an application and they know their credit's not good, they'd rather be told on a chat, no, sorry, your credit's not good really than, than by someone turning around to them and saying, sorry, your credit's not good. Well, that's embarrassing. You just told me that, you know, but actually someone chatting it is like, they're not really there. I can just hear it from the bank. And, you know, so I think how it's used is really important. I mean, we, we all know, you know, mortgage companies have been trying this for a long time now, you know, in terms of selling mortgages and using video for it. And, and, it, and it does work, it does work. Where I, I think it works is in customer service and especially when you start to think about things like augmented reality, where you potentially want to be able to bring in, you know, the example that we used to have when I was in, in my last company was, was we did some work with a, a large retailer in France where, you know, they would sell everything from a, a bit like a, you know, Curry's, can I say, can I mention a name here? Um, you know, but, but a, a retailer. There are other places in retail sectors that you can buy from. <laughs> Thank you. I feel like I'm on BBC now. Um, and, and uh, you yeah, know, so they, they'd have a coffee machine. The coffee machine goes wrong. What do they do? Well, you, know, you get an agent online. There's a big red button they could press, which is a, you know, a call me button. And it comes online up, pops an agent. And that agent then has an augmented reality session with that person. That's cool. You know, that works really well. And, and actually they can they can get the coffee machine on, on the video and, and they can draw circles around the buttons to press and things like that. All of that is, is good value. It's a premium service they might want to offer and, and so forth and so on. So, you know, it, it depends on the use case that you're looking at as to whether camera, 
would work, but I, I don't think we should assume it works on everything um, any more than when we move into the world of meta, we think that that would work for everyone. Yeah. And, and you know, I th I've seen really good use cases in terms of broadband and engineering where you can turn the phone, you can show them the back of your, your TV, exactly that. your broadband router, and exactly. that stops and that reduces the cost of maybe an engineer having to go on site. So it's yeah. like you say, there, there are in, in the sphere of omni-channel communication, I think that's one of those additional points where you say, right, where, where do we use it and how, how best do we um, implement it? The other, the other great example is things like third party bodily injury um, in, in car crashes and so forth, getting things into the process faster, taking a picture, sending it off, being able to set, you know, get an advisor, a claims advisor and, uh, on the phone quickly and showing them the actual scene, um, you know, things like that, which, which certain companies have been trialing. You know, these are all really valuable things. Yeah. I'm going to come to um, a comment from Nick Elston in the uh, in the chat. And, and Nick is obviously um, a well-being and, and mental health specialist. So his conversations are all around human to human conversations. So rather than me read it out, um, Nick, I'm going to invite you to take yourself off mute and, um, and fire your question and your, your observation. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Gary. Um, so, hey, uh, I guess what I was trying to achieve was that I think anybody will understand who have a team of people that you could have like 10 or 20 different people in your team and have 10 or 20 different appearance, um, experiences and opinions on where we are right now. And I think this is the reason why when I was last here, I, I said to you the biggest challenges in terms of mental health are yet to come. I wasn't being a doom merchant, I promise you, but this is kind of what I was referring to is that actually how do we deal with that? Because you literally need 10 or 20 different approaches with people. And I think that whereas before we could generalize a lot more and try and take a group uh, on a journey, it now comes down to showing human to human um, vulnerability, I guess, by showing more of ourselves personally as a human, we get that kind of reaction back, we get an interaction back. And, and this, came from, this came from a piece I was doing for the HR director around even heavy conversations around furlough redundancy and kind of big things like that, we can inject more personality to get that human interaction back. But I think sometimes we can be really afraid of that for fear of comeback on a professional or legal basis. And I think, Andrew, just thinking about that point that, that Nick's just made there, I know as, a, as an organisation, one of uh, Web Help's um, strap lines is think human. And, and creating those great ways of working. I know we've had conversations around how did you create that, that one office that pulls together everybody, either virtually or hybrid, and think about some of the things Nick's just said there. What are your observations in the market in terms of how that's going to develop for the future? Gosh. Um, it could be a whole webinar, that one alone. But um, yeah, I, I, I think um, me mental health is here. Um, I think you have... I heard someone once say, you know, in my days, we'd just take a pill. Um, and that was someone fairly senior in an organization that said that to me not very long ago. Um, and my immediate reaction was, actually, that's probably true. That's probably what we would have done. Um, you know, and, and, and actually, we have a lot of young people. And again, back to my three, I can give us a personal example. You know, my three, at some point in their life, have all taken some kind of depressant medication to, to, you know, because that's what they feel they need. So, you know, clearly the pill is still there, right? And people still use it. As an organization, we have a responsibility for the people that we care for and, and, and who come into our business day in, day out to work for us. Um, and I, I think that it's implicit within us as an organization to make sure that we support mental health across the organization and across the individuals that work for us. And I think, uh, I think the, the, there was an amazing response to COVID the way that we got people to go home to protect them. Um, I think there was a huge response around care for those people while they were at home, a genuine desire to support them as best as organizations could. But I think that because of the nature of mental health, to your point, Nick, you could have 20 people and every one of those would have a different part or different style or something wrong with them that's different to the other. That means you can't have a blanket approach. So we have, we have um, you know, we have, uh, psychologists and mental well-being people we have you know and, and in an office that's it's easy right I, I need a I need a break okay take 10 minute break go to that go to that soft room you know go to the room that you can bang your head on the wall because everything's in phone and um, go to go to this person where you can have a conversation with them start an engagement when you're working at home 
that that wasn't there it was it wasn't there and and you know so we we provide a telephone number for people to go to and we have two telephone numbers in in the case of some of our business particularly around things like content moderation which is is highly emotive um you know we have a telephone number which is um you know a, a member of our staff and if they want to go and talk to them but if they prefer to stay more anonymous then we also have a third party number they can go and talk to where they can have a conversation with someone during the day during their working hour if they need a break or or ideally you know out of hours you know at a point at which they're they're rested and able to think more clearly um and i, I think it's implicit on us as an organization to do that it, that's in the uk if i go outside the uk and, and i come back to this thing of impact sourcing um and uh, you know we we work with a group in south africa for example called harambi um, and Harambia, this amazing organization who bring people out of the townships that, that have got a, a level of capability, a level of education, and they put them into their training. And then those training, then they get recruited into my company and other companies. And we've taken you know, many, many people on in our business. And I had a, a client and I had one of these people on a, on a video call similar to this. And, and I had one of my clients and I said, I just want you to share your thoughts of Think Human, which is the stuff that Gary was mentioning earlier on. And this guy turned around and he said, uh, he said, my, my background is, is I lived in a township. My background is my family are very poor. My background is that we saw a lot of fighting and so forth and so on. Um, and this gave me an opportunity to promote myself, to bring myself forward. I'm now in this. I'm now an SME. The guy smiled from ear to ear. I'm now an SME in this business and I'm about to go on to a new campaign. Being in this business has meant I can support my family. I can support my brothers and sisters through university and so forth and so on. I'm, I'm back to this point of, of, of expectations that we have compared to other countries. And, and I think there's a degree to which we've brought our kids up with, the, you know, in many cases, making them believe that they could be anything they want. In many cases, perhaps not giving them that enthusiasm that they needed to be able to embrace life. Andrew, have, have you disappeared, Andrew? Are you still there? Oh, you're still there. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you? I, I don't know how much you heard now. Um, my final point was just to say, I think there's a, a, a societal need we have in terms of how we address our young people coming through and into these types of roles. There's also an expectation. Why, why should we expect people to come into these kind of roles? What's in it for them? And I don't think we necessarily look holistically at the industry, I think, you know, Nick, uh, in my mind, and, and think holistically. I think, you know, once they're in a job, we do everything we can to support them. But actually, you know, it's great as managers of industry, you know, we're paid big money and expected to do the job, but these people come in on, on not that much money, really, and, and are expected to work very, very hard. You know, we sweat these people. Um, and, and I don't mean my company, I mean, across the piece, we sweat them, and there are people that do far worse. Um, and, and we expect them to keep going. I mean, it's a bit much, really. And thinking about that whole extension of, of people and how we how we communicate with people in a in a virtual and, and digital world and how we create that concept of one office, Andrew, which we, we've talked about at length. How how do we how do we do that successfully and protect the customer and the agent at the same time? Well, one off, one office to me is slightly different to that, guys. So one off to me is is this concept of actually removing front, middle, and back. You know, that's really where one office is to me. It's that ability to make work happen um, and to, you know, remove the, the silos of behavior and, and um, the silos of people having different targets and different outcomes that they're meant to be guiding towards. You know, we've got to get organizations aligned around the customer. And, and, and the problem we have is that so many of our organizations, when you go to, you know, nine out of 10 meetings, the word customer doesn't get brought up. Well, that's got to change. If you go to a digitally native company, I'll pretty much guarantee customer is at the heart of every meeting. Um, if you go to a lot of other buildings, that they're not. And, and we've got to change that mindset. So we've got to get customer at the heart of everything we do from, from the uh, accounts receivable to the third party conversations to whatever it is, is why, 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 what's this going to do for my customer? Because, you know, I, I often refer to it as a music analogy. I would, wouldn't I? Um, you know, if, if you think about in terms of the music that you're, you know, your business represents, a lot of people will think about music they like. Um, actually, what they need to be thinking about is what appeals to their customers. And, and it's not a one size fits all. They have to be able to be multiplicit and approach things in a customer perspective and not a single um, insular view of, of how they see the world. And so, so to me, a one office is that ability to be able to align. It took a long time for RPA to come into the front office, for example. 
you know, it took a long time to start to automate things in the front office that could be fulfilled into the back office because those connections between those parts of the organizations weren't there. Now that's starting to happen. It means that we can free up time for the agents to do more, but we've got to improve the IT for them to go, you know, make it happen quicker. And, and where is that? Where are we on that curve? So if we think about customer satisfaction at the moment, it's playing in around the 71 to 77%. And if we're all looking at that and saying, right, are we happy with 75%, we'd probably all turn around and say no. But actually, where, where do we take that? And what are the key enablers to get us into that consistently 85 90 90 percent plus what needs to happen um in order for us to be able to achieve that gosh um and if you knew you'd probably be doing it already but no, where, but where I, do you think, well, I, think I think i think i think we know the trends i think we know the trends you know i don't i don't think and it's not a one size fits all right you're asking a, a, a question that depending on what company it is it will be different and you know and i'm sure everyone across the the the, the, the call here have got a different opinion um what 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 i what i think i do i do know is that you know we don't we don't deal with things once and done very well you know there are certain points of failure within an organization wait times are horrendous you know promising callbacks and never giving them getting things done the first time you come on the cut on the phone these these things are what are causing people the most distress and i bet if you and i think there was a server i don't know if it was yours but another one but i, think it was, mate, there was, I did one recently and that first call resolution definitely came up as uh, the number one what a surprise you know what a surprise because because it's not even considered right and we don't always consider it in the right way i was talking to a bank once and and they did they were considering it in a really interesting way it's a different way to the way i came at it i came at it in a slightly more techie way because that was a techie at the time um and i said you know are you doing first contact resolution first call resolution they said yeah we've got a whole program on it i said well give me an example and they said well we found that if we could tell a customer when we, what we were doing before was telling a customer that their new card would be delivered next week and and they were calling us every single day to find out where their new card was and with one slight change of phrase to your new card will be with you by the end of next week everything changed and people didn't call back through the week they waited until the end of the week now at the end of the week there might have been a lot of calls if the cards weren't there but they stopped the calling and and so i think there is this approach that we need a we need a you know and i and I'm back to what i said at the beginning i think people are doing this i think people want to do this i don't necessarily think that people are the you know the 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 enemy here i i, I think there's organizations being able to move and bring it all together is what the challenge is and that sits from the top downwards yeah i mean uh graham bunting has um as quoted in the chat one of the um the things that i i I, I love this book and I, I always use this analogy in any training or any kind of process improvement that I look like it. And uh, Graham, I'm not going to steal your thunder, but what's, what's, your, um, what's your view on, on that statement that you, you've made there in the chat and where, where's your thinking going with it? Is that referring to will it make the boat go faster? That's spot on. That's the one that I love the yeah. most. Yeah, I've, I've heard that, that sort of phraseology or, or, or different variations of it over the years, but that's the, uh, the one by the Olympic rower. Um, and actually, it's a really good question. I think regardless of whether it's contact centre or elsewhere, it's a great question to ask when, you know, people start planning a course of action. Um, I think it was it was the question around video for me. It was, you know, will it make the boat go faster, i.e. does it drive a good outcome and experience for the customer and the agent? If the answer is yes, then I would suggest that's probably a great thing to go and invest timing. Yeah, 100%. I completely agree. 100%. And I think it's back, Sarah's... It's back, use, it's back to use case again, isn't it? Definitely. Yeah. And, I, and I, I think Sarah's made a, a really good point and it, it links back to some of the stuff we were talking around, what happens in the call centre. And, and Sarah, you, you've made a few good, great points in the in the chat, but just pick it, picking up on that one in particular around failure demand. You just want to expand on that a little bit further for us and ask you a question. Yeah, no, I mean, um, hi, everyone. Um, <laughs> kind of my experience in um, the force control room at Lancashire Constabulary was sort of very similar to what you were saying, Andrew, in respect of um, you know, recall and um, waste demand and, you know, ultimately on kind of um, analysing um, the demand and looking at the type and frequency, um, the kind of the, the main sort of contribution to that was the failure to empower um, our staff. And, you know, ultimately, the police control room operators who were all, who were all highly proficient and extremely competent in doing their role um, wanted to sort of take it one step further. And, you know, as a result of it, what we kind of saw was that, for instance, um, 
a member of the public would ring up, a victim of crime would ring up to say that they'd been, say, a victim of criminal damage of an eye and they required a crime reference number to give to their, let's say, for instance, they lived on a local authority housing estate and they needed to give the crime reference number to the council in order to get their window fixed. Um, what would then normally happen is that the member of the public would um all the details would be taken by the police control room operator who would then ultimately have to place that member of public into a queue for a police officer to get back in touch with them to issue the crime reference number and that could take days you know depending on demand and um you know the availability of the officer so what we we sort of did as part of um change management project was empowered the staff to actually give that crime reference number at first point of contact so I gave them sort of a basic understanding of the national crime recording standards and um, went through sort of very sort of basic crime recording and that kind of thing with them and also gave them training in how to use the crime recording system and um, I think it was called SLUF at the time and by just doing that and making that change um, had a massive, massive impact on waste demand as well as customer satisfaction. Um, but a noticeable change was the morale in the force control room went up because the agents who, again, wanted that extra responsibility and um, mm. wanted to feel empowered and that we actually trusted them had a spring in the step again. And it improved attrition rate as well. So it had a massive, massive knock-on effect, not just for the customer, but also for the staff within the control room. And, you know, the end-to-end -end journey was improved. And we just didn't have, I think we um, reduced um, waste demand by 40% of that nature. A massive, massive impact. So, you know, I think it's really, really important. And what I'm seeing now within a lot of outsourced contact centres that I have calls to deal with, they fear their fear empowering the staff. And because of that, that has a massive knock-on effect on the customer and the actual staff within the control room. So, and I, and I think that's a really interesting point. And thanks for, for sharing that, Sarah. So thinking about that longer term, Andrew, how can we utilize technology as an enabler to, re to help us reduce that failure demand and anticipate and get on the front foot of it? So we, we stop it from even reaching the agent. What would your view be on, on using technology and AI to kind of lessen the impact on that failure? Um, I, I think I think we're back to omni-channel, really, and, and the way omni-channel can work. And, and you know, I, I always used to talk about, you know, the inception of customers into an organisation and that first initial understanding of why they're coming into your organisation rather than throwing it at an IDR or an ADR. Let's try and understand more and apply more intelligence, use a data-led approach to trying to gather why your customer, who your customer is, why they might be calling, um, use the data that you've got. You know, for example, if they, you, you should be able to know if, if not, if you're a retailer, because it doesn't get registered, but maybe if you're a bank or an or a, a other, other organization, you know, that that customer has just bought a product, um, you know, that they haven't paid their bill yet. There are certain things that you should be able to identify as an organization and failure to you if you don't know, um, because you should be able to get to that point. And, and if you do, you can apply all of those things together. For example, I bought a product. I haven't paid my latest round. I've rung up three times to say that it's not been working. Do you expect me to pay? Well, actually, should that go through to account arrears or should it go through to customer care and actual complaints? You know, actually understanding where that needs to go will give me a better chance um, of, of making sure I put that call into the right place. Um, there are basic things like I'm ringing for a new card that we shouldn't ever get in front of someone, you know, that we just need to apply the right technology up front. So, you know, I think the technology is there. There is nothing stopping people doing it, um, you know, but it's not at a price point that everyone can afford yet. And that's part of the challenge. I think the price is coming down. You know, certainly, you know, you and I were talking a little bit around, um, you know, voice transcription and, uh, and, you know, the accuracy on voice transcription is enough to get a lot of this going. And, and if you can hit 80% of this, 90% of this accurately, then that's not a bad start, right? Um, but the cost of voice transcription is prohibitive for a lot of small organizations. Um, for a, a digitally native organization, it's not a problem because it's digital. So you don't have to do that transcription. So depending on you know, the, the, the type of organization and the type of customer coming in, I think you can apply a lot more intelligence up front. So you can manage that call demand. You can manage the um, the, 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 the the wastage that, that you, you can get rid of up front. You can remove for that from downstream. Um, you know, we have, there's a lot of people who drop emails into organizations to say thank you. 
and that still gets into an email queue yeah. of someone who then has to put a response back to say thank you for saying thank you <laughs> why why we're really pleased that you're happy but we'll do it as an automated response yeah you know, and, and you know what? It leads you back onto that whole piece to say, right? Quite often, we we associate technology such as AI, robotics, automation, and all those great tools as something that only larger size or mid mid to large size co- contact centers can afford. How do we make technology and customer service of the future more affordable and more accessible? to smaller end contact centers what's what's the what's the way to to crack that nut do you think i think i think it's happening i think it's just it's a slow burn you know you can't you know as long as technology companies can go and sell their their technology to every man and its beast but i'll tell you for a fact now between outsourcing technology we're quite interested in the smaller people now Mm. um you know we quite like them we think that actually they've got a good future so why not invest um, you know, so I think technology companies are, have got their eye on them and they know that they need to come in at the right price point. Maybe they come in as a pay as you play. Um, you know, maybe they change their model to be able to make it more affordable. So as people scale, they can scale with them. Um, you know, I, I think there are lots of ways that it can be done. Um, and, you know, and I've been on a few panels over the last few years with technology providers talking about how they can do this. And you know, as long as we live in a license model where it's a perpetual license, it can still be prohibitive. You know, you go to a pay as you play. Well, that's a different thing. You know, you go as a risk reward. Why not have a technology company invest um, a belief in, a, in a, an upcoming unicorn that actually they think could go somewhere? That's a really good thing. Um, you know, I think there's lots of ways to do this. And I think there's lots of ways that technology companies need to respond. And if I'm honest with you, and, and you know, don't say this outside this forum, I think technology companies have had a, you know, a, a lot of the, um, the challenge that has been presented has been presented because of the way that technology companies think and have behaved and have come forward in the industry with their siloed view about, about behavior and about customer. Um, I think it's really interesting that the big customer shows are dominated by technology firms and not by people who really have customer at heart. Yeah, I think so. And I, I think we've got time for, for one final question. So I'm just going to ask you in terms of if there were three pieces of advice uh, you were mm-hmm. going to give to a contact center of the future or three areas where you think in the next 12 months, these are going to be the big ticket items to watch out for. Uh, what would you say um, those particular areas might be? Thanks. Um, I, 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 I got that one on the hoof, so I'll, I'll fill for a second while you have a think. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I mean, so, so the first one is mental health is real. Um, we can't skirt around it. Um, and I think part of the resignation piece that's going on in the press at the moment, and I do think some of it's generated by the press because they like to do that, um it is is it is there and it is happening so i think first off we need to protect the people that we have we need to care about the people we have we need to give them reasons to come to work and do what they do endlessly and tirelessly a lot of the time um and and make it a bit more exciting for them you know to the point that i think uh, sarah you made earlier on it doesn't take very much that we can we can suddenly make something that they do a bit more interesting and make them feel more valued um, you know, I think that promotion of moving them through the company is key, um, you know, so they don't always feel they're in the same role and never getting anywhere. Otherwise, what, I would leave. I don't know about anyone else. I'd leave. I wouldn't stay doing the same job for too long. Um, I think that companies have to recognize that um, they have to get stuff right up, up, up at the top of the, at the, top of the, the journey for the customer um, and that they need a mechanism for feeding stuff from here right the way back through the organization to make that onboarding journey happen and uh, you know a very quick example a bank did a study on their distribution channels they came up with about 150 different things that they thought they could action over over 60 percent of those were related to back office they went to the back office organization they turned around and said no we're really sorry we've got our own priorities now that's that's not right right so we've got to get that that end-to-end kind of thinking right and uh, and and you know and then we might improve the customer journey there's two for you. Um, I haven't got a third one at the moment. Two, two very, very powerful ones. And I think um, some really great suggestions and some good advice there. And thank you to everybody who has uh, commented and asked questions in the uh, in the chat. If we've not got round to everybody, um, apologies. It, there was lots in there. And I think, Andrew, you've shared some really um, useful insights and everybody's um, been able to kind of contribute to that, which I think is great. I've, uh, I've attached the link to next month's event into the chat for anybody who wants to um, join on to next month's where we'll be talking about leadership and culture in contact centers.
But the final thing for me to say is thank you very much to Andrew. Thank you again to um, Ewan as well, who supported um, Andrew in, in marketing this and, and bringing this, uh, this to life. It's been a really great discussion uh, from my perspective. Um, Al Hughes is going to be joining us next month for a um, uh, panellist conversation around culture and leadership. And I know he's got a lot to say around culture. Um, he's a man of the hour for that. Um, but thank you once again, Andrew, for um, for for stepping up to the plate and uh, for sharing such great stuff there. And thanks, everybody, for uh, for dialing in. Thanks for having me. Thank you, everyone. See you all again next month. Take care. Bye bye.